Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our virtual online roadshow, another event with another fantastic company. As you are used to, our companies are of high quality, and we are really happy and proud to present Skina Resources uh, today with Kelly Earl, the Vice President of Communications, and a very warm welcome also to Vancouver, Kelly. Hi, how are you? Hi, Jochen. I'm well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you on board here. That's fantastic. So people are checking in now. That's fantastic too. Oh, already at 49. I love to see that. And uh, yeah, let me do some pre-notices uh, and some pre-marks before we start. We give it another minute here. Yeah, my name is Jochen Steiger. As of course, most of you know me. I'm the founder and CEO of Swiss Resource Capital and also the founder and chief editor of uh, Commodity TV and Rohstoff TV. And through Corona and COVID-19, of course, we had to switch our physical presentations, our physical roadshows now to this format. But uh, yeah, a lot of uh, investors really like and appreciate what we are doing here. So this is fantastic that you are all with us today. And I'm pretty sure you will absolutely not be disappointed by Skina because it's an outstanding company. Uh, just uh, for disclosure reasons, reasons, I am a shareholder also in the company and I'm a long-term shareholder. And as you have maybe followed my chart analysis, uh, I give the company already a price target around the $7 range. And uh, it looks like that the company is really working fantastically on it as they have just released some great drill results again on the 21C zone, but also on the water tower zone with uh, yeah, something like seven grams over 20 meters, which is outstanding. And the good drill results are really going on. But I will not hold the presentation of uh, Kelly for sure. Uh, that is her job to do. And also, so let uh, me finish here with the closing remarks. Just one thing. We are fully complying to the European and Swiss data security law. So nobody can see each other. Also, no names are displayed. And uh, if you have questions, because we will do now 25 minutes of presentations, as you are used to that. And when you have questions, please use the chat function, which is the third point in the vertical gray bar on your right side. There is chat. I have already written something into that. And use that, please, for your questions. And uh, yeah, that would be great. So it looks like that we have already, wow, 58 people in. I love that. That is outstanding. That speaks for your company, Kelly, actually. Thank you. And also, I have to say, I'm really happy that we have finally a woman presenting because oh, that's wow. also not normal. Yes. I'm used to it. So we are also fully complying here with this. Uh, Kelly, I would say the floor is yours. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. So good morning, everyone, or I guess good good late afternoon if, if you're in Europe. Uh, Skino Resources is a TSX listed company. We're also listed on the OTCQX and the Frankfurt Exchange. And today I'm going to be talking about our flagship project, which is the SK Creek Project, located in the Golden Triangle of Northwest British Columbia in Canada. So we will move along to the obligatory forward-looking statements. And then we'll move right into a project location. So Golden Tri Triangle is an, an infamous area, you know, a lot of very high grade deposits. Uh, we have two past producing mines called SNP and SK Creek. We acquired both of these from Barrick. And as of last uh, Monday, actually, we now own 100% of SK Creek, which is very exciting. We also own 100% of SNP. And uh, SK Creek is really going to be the focus of this discussion. So I'll, I'll briefly talk about the board and the management team. Uh, Walter Coles is our CEO. He's stepped in to be CEO uh, just over five years ago. So the entire management team and board, we are all new within the last five years. Our latest addition to the management team is Shane Williams. Shane is our new chief operating officer. He came to us from, um, he was with El Dorado Gold before us. He put what was Integra's Labac project into production. He has a lot of experience with open pit mines in the north in Sweden and in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, so he's, he's really a good fit for us because there's a lot of similarities between the projects he'd worked on before and our SK Creek open pit project. Uh, Paul Geddes is our VP of exploration. He came to us from the Osisco group of companies. He was with Barkerville, but left there a few years ago because he was so excited about the potential at SK Creek. Um, I look after the communications and investor relations, but I'm also a geologist by background. And finally, Justin Himmelwright is our VP of sustainability, which is usually a bit rare for a company of our size, but environmental permitting and First Nations issues are so important when you have two past producing mines. So that's what Justin heads up. 
Um, as for our board of directors, Craig Perry is our chairman. He's one of the founders of uh, NextGen and EMR Capital, and he's a former Rio Tinto geologist. And then our latest addition to the board that I'll mention is Greg Beard. He was the former head of uh, natural resources for uh, Apollo Global Management, and we're really excited to bring him on board as our market cap continues to grow and we, we seek more um, institutional investors. So moving on to infrastructure in the area, if you've listened to my presentations before, you know this is something that we always talk about because it's just so important. There have been vast improvements in infrastructure in this area of the Golden Triangle since SK Creek and SNP were in production. So when they were in production in the 90s and early 2000s, they were fly in, fly out, they were all diesel powered. So 50% of the operating expenses at SK were fuel historically. And now we have Highway 37 and the Northwest Transmission Line that was built and it goes all the way up to what is now Newcrest Red Chris Mine. And then right in between SNP and SK Creek, we've had three hydroelectric facilities built within the last 10 years. So we have access to six cents Canadian per kilowatt hour power now. So an area that was once remote is not any longer and it you know, having this much infrastructure greatly uh, decreases the cutoff grade at which you can mine. So we'll get right into SK Creek, a little bit of history. It produced from 94 to 2008, and it's the former highest grade gold mine in the world. So produced at extremely high grades, 3.3 million ounces of gold were produced, 160 million ounces of silver, 45 grams per ton was the gold grade and over 2000 grams per ton was the silver grade. So if you look that on a combined um, gold equivalent, it produced at two and a half ounces per ton gold equivalent. So just extremely high grade. As I mentioned, this uh, mine was quite remote at the time. It was all diesel powered and the prices of gold were substantially lower when the mine was in production, say anywhere from two to $450 an ounce. So because of this, the cutoff grades were extremely high. So when the mine started, it was direct shipping ore only while they were waiting to build the mill. And that had a 30 gram per ton gold equivalent cutoff. That meant anything below 30 grams was waste. Then once the mill was built, the cutoff grade dropped to 15 grams per ton. So our thesis in acquiring SK Creek was pretty simple. What materials left behind that was not economic because the cutoff grade was so high and it was so remote when it was in production that would be economic now at a much lower cutoff grade. And the other thing that we decided to look at was this uh, whole project from an open pit perspective as opposed to underground. So it was an all underground mine historically. Now we were looking at it from an open pit perspective. This is the resource that we put out in November of last year along with our preliminary economic assessment. The global resource is sitting at 4 million ounces, grading 4.4 grams per ton gold equivalent. So it's extremely high grade for an open pit. You can see the main 21 zone pit there and then off to the right to the south, there's the 22 zone satellite pit. It's a fairly shallow pit. It averages uh, 180 meters and the deepest part of the pit is only 236 meters. There's about 300,000 ounces that are underground that we did not push forward into the PEA. So PEA is only open pit and the PFS will also only be open pit, but we hope to be able to add an underground component to a mine in the future. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I would point out the grade difference here is circled between the indicated and the inferred, and that's because there's there's quite a difference. So indicated ounces are averaging 5.9 grams per ton gold equivalent, and these are in areas that were previously previously mined. So drill spacing is, is very tight, 10 to 15 meter centers. When we get to the inferred ounces, these are areas that were never mined before, like the end of the 21 zone, the 22 zone, and the drill spacing in these areas is more like 50 to 75 meters. And when you're working on a resource, um, when there's separation of that much between the drill holes, then there's a bit of uncertainty in the grade. And we're finding as we do infill drilling, so Skeen is uh, busy um, in the middle of a 90,000 meter drill program, about 70% of that is infill drilling because we need to move all those inferred ounces into the indicated category in order, order to push forward with our pre-feasibility study. So we've lots of infill drilling to do, as you can see, because we have over half the resource, so there's 14.7 million tons that are still in the inferred category. But we're having pleasant surprises, and we find that when we're doing the infill drilling, so putting holes in between the inferred holes, we're hitting pockets of higher grade. So we're not only giving certainty to the grade, but we're also able to increase the grade, which means increasing the ounces. 
So I mentioned that the global resource is 4 million ounces at 4.4 grams per ton gold equivalent right now. And our target is to hit 5 million ounces at 5 grams per ton gold equivalent. And uh, we will reach that, hopefully, fingers crossed, in uh, Q1 of next year when we have a resource update out. We're going to finish all the infill drilling by the end of the year, have a resource update out in Q1, and then push forward with the pre-feasibility study in Q2. So next, I wanted to talk about uh, the PEA, which came out in November of last year, contemplates a nine-year mine life, producing and shipping a straight concentrate, producing 306,000 gold equivalent ounces per year. Uh, the average all uh, average overall life of mine grade is 4.17 grams per ton gold equivalent. So again, extremely high grade for an open pit. The initial capex is only $233 million US. That's because this is a brownfield site. So there's a, a number of, um, there's quite a bit of infrastructure already on site. And also uh, we're just producing and shipping a straight concentrate. There's no dory being produced on site. So that helps to keep the capex down as well. So we did the PEA in November 2019. You see we did it at $13.25 gold, $16 silver. Of course, we are closer to the right-hand side now. Um, I know there's a lot of gold bugs in Europe, so maybe I'll quote the $1,900 prices. Uh, so at $1,900 gold and $23 silver, as we has an after-tax NPV at a 5% discount of $1.5 billion, an 89% after-tax IRR, a 0.7 of a year after-tax payback, it's just an extremely robust project. And that's of course, because it's so high grade for an open pit, but because it's so high grade, our downside is also protected. So this is a project that would still work at 1200 or a thousand dollar gold. So I wanted to touch briefly on the mine design and there's just two things I wanted to point out. Um, that's the former waste dump and the permitted TSF. So the tailing storage facility. So these are both what we call dead or non fish bearing lakes. They're natural water bodies. They make uh, perfect containment sites. There's one discharge point on the overall mine site, which is a, a benefit in the permitting process. So the former waste dump is where they put all the waste rock historically. And as I mentioned previously, for the first few years of the mine life, the cutoff grade was 30 grams per ton while they were doing direct shipping ore. So that meant that anything below 30 grams per ton went into this waste dump. And you can see the piles there on the, the picture on the right hand side. So we estimate there's several hundred thousand ounces sitting in Albino Lake here. So this is a way uh, that we hope to add some ounces to the mine life in the future. And we uh, look to be able to drill this off at some point next year. As for the permitted TSF, we're very fortunate. There's ample storage capacity. All the tailings were stored subaqueously historically. We look at doing this again with all the tailings from the PEA. And it's really important to point out that it's already permitted. So this is a brownfield site. This is a permitted discharge point under the Mines Act. It has ample capacity and it will only require minor amendments when we go through the permitting process, which is great because tailing storage facilities are usually what takes the longest amount of time to permit in BC, and we already have a permitted one. So that's a, a huge bonus. Um, so, so, sorry, sorry, Kelly, can you say the last sentence again, please, because you were just cut off. Sure, so I was saying that um, our tailing storage facility is already permitted under the Mines Act because this is a brownfield site, so that greatly expedites the permitting process. Normally, um, a TSF is what takes the most amount of time to permit in British Columbia, and we already have a permitted TSF with ample storage capacity. So that greatly um, increases the permitting time frame because there's only minor amendments that we'll have to make to that existing permit. Mm -hmm. In terms of exploration upside left on the project, there's a substantial amount. Uh, what you're looking at here um, on the image is our current resource in gold. You can see the pit outline there in black. All the little blue dots are historic drill holes. We inherited a substantial database from Barrick, over 700,000 meters of assay data. And what's highlighted here is anything greater than three grams over two meters, because that's what we think the minimum mining grade and width would be. So uh, this type of deposit is called a VMS. It's a vulcanogenic massive sulfide. And very simply, it just represents the sea floor. And you can see there's a purple line there, and that's the main mineralized zone that was mined out historically. It's called the contact mudstone. Essentially, underneath the seafloor, we have rhyolites that have uh, feeder structures. So essentially, the plumbing system comes up underneath the seafloor and the rhyolites. As soon as it hits the cold ocean water, you get the main mineralization event. That's when all the mineralization dumps out in this contact mudstone horizon that was formed at the seafloor. So that's what carried the two and a half ounce per ton material historically. So on a tonnage weighted basis, about 25 to 30% of our resources in that ultra high grade contact mudstone. 
but the majority of our resource, over 70%, is really in the rhyolite horizon that's just below that. So in terms of exploration, we're looking for other mudstone horizons. So VMS deposits are often known to come in stacked sequences, and that's because the seafloor moves over time. So we're looking for mudstone horizons that are earlier in the geologic sequence and would have formed millions of years earlier. And specifically, we're looking for where these interact with the feeder structures, which is the plumbing network. So you can see some circles there, uh, the WT, the water tower zone, the 21C zone, the 22. These are all areas that are completely outside of our current resource where we're looking for lower mudstone units. And then finally, way off to the right hand side to the south, you can see a circle around Tom McKay. This is a really exciting target for us. This is several kilometers away from the from the 22 zone pit. And this was historically mined in the 1930s. There's about 20 historic drill holes here, but again, the cutoff grades were so high historically between 15 to 30 grams per ton that the exploration drilling wasn't high enough grade. And I'm talking about um, assay results, say 10 grams gold and 20 grams silver over eight to, to 10 meters, sometimes up to 20 meters. So very high grade by today's standard. And a lot of these historic hits start at surface or just 10 meters below surface. So this is a very exciting target for us that we've just started drilling and hopefully um, we'll have some success there and maybe we'll have another open pit component to the mine in the future. So I'll show you some results we've had so far, specifically from the 21C zone. And this is an area where we're looking for lower mudstone horizons and a potential underground component to the mine. So here's a cross section through the 21C. You can see there's a basalt cap sitting on the deposit at the top. Then below that, we've got the mineralization in the orangey color. So the uh, mudstone mineralization is in the dark orange. And right below that is the rhyolite mineralization. And this is an area where we were doing infill drilling. So you can see the three holes at the top. We had a really exciting hit of 25 grams over 35 meters. It's important to note that grade compared to the grade of the two um, just to the left of it, which were more like six grams over 35 meters. So this is how I mentioned that we're gonna get that grade of the inferred closer to five grams because we keep pleasantly hitting pockets where we're ha having higher grades. So in an area where we thought it was more like six grams over 35 meters, we hit a zone where it's 25 grams over 35 meters. So that's how we're so certain that we're gonna be able to hit that five million ounces at five grams per ton gold equivalent target with all the infill drilling that we're doing right now. And then again, I mentioned that VMS has come in stack sequences. So once we did the infill at the top, we kept the drill holes going and sure enough, we've tagged into a new LM zone. So the lower mudstone zone, we see that spectacular hit 314 grams over 2.21 meters. That was followed up by 12.27 over six meters. And this is in an area that's completely outside the current resource. And then we had one hole that went even deeper at the very bottom there. You can see the ELM, the even lower mudstone unit, and that hit 6.26 grams over 4.2 meters. Again, another mudstone horizon earlier in geologic time. Um, these are completely outside of the current resource. And this is how we hope to be able to add an underground component to the mine in the future. So it's, it's pretty early days for exploration. These are the, the first three exploration drills that came out. We've had, uh, say, about uh, 20 that have come out since then, but it's still very early days. I mentioned that we're pretty focused on infill drilling, but all the exploration results that we have this year will help guide our exploration program for next year. So um, exciting days ahead for sure on the exploration side at SK. So I'm quickly going to talk about valuation. Um, Skeena, we feel Skeena is extremely undervalued compared to our peers right now. We're trading at about uh, 0.4 times multiple if you look at our price to net asset value compared to our peers. Um, you know, there's several reasons for this. It's only a PEA stage. Um, we have a long way to go on the engineering side and pushing it forward to PFS and then the full feasibility. And we would hope that as we hit these milestones and, and continue to grow the project and advance it towards production over the next 18 months, that we will continue to move up uh, closer to the one times NAV. And uh, we would argue that such a high grade open pit deposit in a tier one jurisdiction should really be trading at a, um, a premium to NAV. So we will continue to market and promote it and, and move it along the engineering and the geologic side to really you know, increase the price to NAV and get that share price up for our shareholders. 
So the bottom shows um, just how unique SK Creek is. So the average grade worldwide for an open pit mine is only 1.5 grams per ton. And SK is sitting all the way up at 4.3 grams per ton gold equivalent. And we see a pretty clear pathway to bringing it up to five grams per ton gold equivalent. And when we can do that and get it back into production, it'll be one of the highest grade open pit mines in the world. A few more comparables. Our first is our capital intensity ratio, which is extremely low compared to our peers at only $89 US per ounce. And that's because we're producing so many ounces per year. So for an extremely modest uh, capex, initial capex of only 233 million US, you're getting 306,000 gold equivalent ounces per year. So you know it's producing a lot of ounces and if we're able to get that grade even higher, so if we can get it from the 4.2 closer to the five, that's no extra cost to us. That's just increasing the grade, which means we could get the ounce per year increased as well. So we're sitting on, at 306,000 a year, and we're hoping with the, the next resource and the PFS coming out, that'll surpass 350,000 ounces per year. So I'm just going to talk about the timeline next. So we're busy doing infill drilling. I mentioned we're in the middle of a 90,000 meter uh, drill program. We just had more results out this morning and those will continue to come out every few weeks until uh, probably right through to January. Uh, we've already started the, the permitting process. Uh, we're about to put a, a project proposal together um, that we'll put to the government and that'll give the framework for the permitting that we're looking for. So that's um, happening as we speak. Then in Q1 of next year, it's a very exciting milestone. We'll put an updated resource out, and that's when we hope to hit the 5 million ounces at 5 grams per ton gold equivalent target. That'll quickly be followed up with a pre-feasibility study. That'll be in Q2. And then we'll follow it up with a full feasibility study in Q4. And um, off the back of the feasibility study, we'll launch project financing, and we hope to start construction in Q1 of 2022. We're estimating a two-year uh, construction phase, and that's because it'll be a staged process. So as I mentioned, we have existing permits on site already, so we can start construction in areas where we have existing permits, and then as other permits come in, we'll start that construction later. So our, our base case is uh, production to start in Q1 of 2024, but of course, we're going to try to expedite that with our, our uh, government and First Nations relations that we have in place currently. So I briefly wanted to talk about SNP. This is our other project, because the one thing that I didn't mention on the last timeline was the, you know, the phase two potential at SK Creek. So we, we are permitting for an open pit uh, because we want to, you know, um, do this as quickly as possible. And also you have to stick to a plan. So we had a PEA that had open pit only. We're going to do the PFS with an open pit only. But we do envision that there could be a stage two to the mine life at SK Creek. That could be pushing back the pit further, adding an underground component, or potentially adding SNP uh, to SK Creek and trucking ore from SNP over to SK Creek. So at some point next year, we will have a PEA update on SK Creek out, and that'll show the phase two mine plan. Um, it's a bit early days to determine exactly which of the three things I mentioned will, will work out, the pushback of the pit, uh, the underground, or the SNP, because we're still in the process of drilling right now and then figuring out the engineering. So, uh, sorry, sorry, Kelly, sorry, Kelly, you just got cut out again. Ah. Can you do the last sentence also? I'm sorry for that. That's okay. Yeah, so I'm, We I'm have a very bumpy signal on your side. I'm very sorry. So I was mentioning that uh, there'll be a phase two to the mine plan at SK Creek at some point, but it's just too early to tell what that'll look like yet because we're still drilling and doing the engineering. But we should have a PEA update to talk about a phase two at some point next year. And one of the things we're considering for the phase two is the potential of adding SNP to SK Creek. So SNP is about 50 kilometers away from SK Creek. It's another high grade pass producer. We optioned this from Barrick and then subsequently acquired 100% produced 1.1 million ounces at 28 grams per ton, so extremely high grade, and we've had some success exploration rise. And we put out this uh, resource just earlier um, this year. The current resource is sitting at 650,000 ounces at 13 and a half grams per ton gold. So small resource, but extremely high grade at 13 and a half grams per ton gold. This project's very different from SK Creek. It's all underground. And we're looking at the possibility of taking this high grade ore and trucking it over to SK to add some high grade ounces to the mine life in the first few years. So 
Uh, we're going to be doing some more drilling starting this month to see if we can increase this resource and then we'll pass it off to the engineers and they can tell us if it, it makes sense economically to combine SNP with SK. Uh, we'll be drilling in this area here called the 200 foot wall. This is where we had that spectacular high grade hit at the end of last year, 1131 grams over a meter and a half. So we'll be following up in this 200 foot wall zone to see just how big this um, the shear structure is and if we can add any more ounces and then we'll decide if it makes sense to add this to SK. The last thing I wanted to talk about is our First Nations relations. We are very fortunate to be in Taltan territory. Taltan considers themselves to be a mining nation. They put uh, Predium into production, uh, Red Chris, they've permitted uh, Galore Creek and uh, Seabridge's KSM. We're the founding members of an alliance with the Taltan, the British Columbia Regional Mining Alliance. The first of its kind, a collaboration between industry, First Nations, and the British Columbia Ministry of Mines. And the sole purpose of this alliance is to promote mining investment and education in the Golden Triangle of BC. It's been very successful. Chad Day, the president of the Taltan, has traveled around the world with us to many conferences uh, to promote mining investment. And we're just very pleased to have them as our partners as we move forward on SK Creek. Final slides, capital structure, currently 194 million shares outstanding. We're sitting right around a $500 million Canadian market capitalization, about $22 million left in the bank right now. So we're well financed to take us through all the drilling we're doing right now. Um, analyst coverage has all started this year. So everybody you see there for analyst coverage, that's all new this year. So that's exciting for us and we hope that will continue. We've had a very successful year share price wise, but as I mentioned, we still feel we're quite undervalued. So long way to go to continue to get that share price up. So with that, I'll pass it back off to you, Jochen, to see if there are any questions. Super. Thank you very much. That was a real firework, I would say, of information yeah, and yeah. Uh, really fast. I hope that everybody could cope uh, with the fast English, but uh, I think it's uh, a lot of self-explaining for sure. So let me have a look shortly here in the chat. Okay. So hang on one second. Oh, tons of questions. Ooh, la, la. So let me see. Okay. We start with uh, the 25 meter buffer zone. Why yes. was it restricted? What is the history of this zone? Sure. So um, we optioned this project from Barrick. We did that in December of 2017. It was a three year option. And um, we did the same thing with SNP and Barrick had uh, insisted on a 25 meter buffer around historic workings while we were under option. And this was for liability reasons. They didn't want us drilling near the underground workings until the project was 100 percent ours. So in British Columbia, uh, in order to, for us to gain ownership, which we just finalized last week, the government has to transfer title over and Skeena had to post an environmental bond with the government. So that means that we are liable for what happens to the project. And until that happened, Barrick didn't want us drilling within the 25 meter buffer. It's very standard. We had the same deal with SNP. And so excitingly, uh, because we just acquired 100% of the asset, I announced that last Monday, we can now drill within the 25 meter buffer. And that's very important because there's some inferred ounces in there that we need to convert into the indicated category. And it's also very important because there's um, right around the old stopes, there's a very high grade core that we've yet to be able to drill. We feel there's several hundred thousand ounces of high grade material within those stopes that we have not yet been able to test. So very exciting times ahead. We'll start drilling that shortly and then we'll be able to add some more high grade ounces to the resource. So yes, a good point and I'm glad they brought that up. So 25 meter buffer is all gone. Yeah, then there's also a question from an analyst from Frankfurt. You can drill the whole year on all the whole year on, on the projects, right? Mm -hmm. So we're very fortunate we have road access. So I mentioned there's a hydro facility that just opened up nearby us. It's only 10 kilometers down the road. We can drive in and out year round. We prioritize helicopter drilling in the summer when the weather's good. And then the winter, we actually move the drill around on skids. So it's a giant sled essentially. So very fortunate we can drill year round and it's October and every other project in that area for exploration is wrapping up and we're gonna keep going. So. We'll finish this 90,000 meter drill program in December and then take a short Christmas break and then we'll be back there again in January. Okay, great. And also from the same guy from Frankfurt, another question is, how do you see the chance of course of an increased mine life? I mean, for sure you have that starting mine life, but you have so much potential open pit, but also underground, I can imagine you can do that for the next 30 years, right? Yes, yeah, so we very much 
the uh, mine life extension at some point. So I mentioned we're permitting the open fit. Um, it, you can't change your permit plan once you submit it, you have to stick to it. So we're pushing that forward as quickly as we can with the phase one, with the um, open pit that we've envisioned in the PEA. But then, as I mentioned, there sh will be a phase two at some point, and that's when we could either have an underground component, we could push back the pit, perhaps we add SNP. So it's it's early days. Um, I mean, I know we've put out a 4 million ounce resource, but Skeena ourselves, we actually haven't done much drilling. The majority of that is is historical that we inherited. So it's, it's too soon to tell which of those three will help um, add to the mine plan. But yes, most definitely we envision that at some point uh, we'll, we'll put a phase two out and it'll be longer than the current nine year mine life. Mm -hmm. So from another gentleman from Frankfurt is the question, do you really want to go by yourself in production or could you also imagine, let's say, to be taken over? I mean, this is not an imagination of yours. This would happen if everybody agrees to it. But uh, the pure absence is that you want to go in production, right? So listen, everything's for sale for the right price. We will do, <laughs> sure. we will do what's in the best interest of our shareholders. Um, as part of the deal to acquire 100%, Barrick became a 12% shareholder of Skeena. Um, so the, the reason they did this is, you know, we're not yet the size of, that Barrick would be interested in. Bristow has been pretty public. He wants 5 million ounces producing half a million ounces a year. And we're not there yet. We're at 4 million ounces producing 300,000 ounces a year. That said, we see a clear pathway to that. And Barrick, I think, sees a pathway to that as well, which is why they were happy to become a 12% shareholder. That kind of puts their, their toe in the water. And if we do hit, hit their targets for tier one assets, we'd be a prime takeover candidate for Barrick. Um, I can tell you we've had a lot of interest from other mid-tiers and majors as well. We're not ready to sell yet. We see a lot of value left. Um, you know, getting the next resource, the PFS, pushing it forward on the permitting side. Um, these are all things that will add value. So we don't want to sell too early. Um, we've definitely built a team that could put it into production ourselves. That was why we added our chief operating officer, Shane Williams. Um, but, you know, if the right price came along, we, we would definitely sell it. But it's, it's just too early to tell right now. Yeah, that's right. I like that. Uh, that um, how can I say that? Uh... Uh, uh, intention of yours, uh, because I don't want to give my shares for four dollars away. Exactly. <laughs> That's for sure. I yeah, yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> that would be really too early. So that answers already the question I got uh, this afternoon by telephone from a newsletter writer. So let's move on with his second question. Um, do you think you might have any problems uh, with the environmental permits for SK Creek, maybe for SNP? Do you see anything there? We don't. And one of the reasons is they're brownfield sites. And in British Columbia, the most difficult part of the permitting process is the First Nations relations. And we have worked extremely hard on this. Um, and if the First Nations are supportive of your project, then it's much easier on the government side to allow the project to go through. And mm -hmm. we do everything with our First Nation partners first. We talk to Taltan first and then talk to the government afterwards, which I think is the reverse of most companies, which makes no sense to me. If you don't have the First Nation support, you're not gonna get the project permitted. But the, uh, the two assets are brownfield site, which makes a massive difference. So um, having brownfield sites means we have existing permits. So for example, Tailing storage facility is already permitted under the Mines Act for SK Creek. Um, you know, they mentioned about SNP. Uh, the, the most difficult part would be a road extension that we need to build between SNP and SK Creek. There's about a five kilometer Sorry, gap. Sorry, you just cut out again. You just cut out again. My apologies. Can you hear me? Yes, and, now I can hear you. <laughs> well, uh, I was just talking about SNP. You know, one of the harder parts there was there was about a five kilometer gap in the road uh, that we would need to build to truck or from SNP to SK. And that's already permitted as well. So that's already gone through the permitting process. So there are a lot of benefits to brownfield sites and, um, and um, existing permits is one of them. So we don't anticipate any issues. Mm -hmm. And you also will not, or you have not seen so far any, let's say, heavy metal contaminations uh, from the old productions you have to clean up or clear or there's, there's not a problem, right? Absolutely not. I mean, this was a barrack site, so it was held to very high standards in terms of reclamation. Uh, it's been continuously water monitored on a quarterly basis for the last several decades. There's no remobilization of anything stored subaqueously. Uh, so no, we're in great shape. And I mentioned there's only one discharge point on the entire project. So mm -hmm. no, we're very fortunate in that regard. 
Super. Um, then there's another question from an investor. I think he's from Geneva. Skina's team has been extremely methodical in their exploration. Has there been any big surprises for them? Listen, I don't think surprises. I mean, SK Creek is a world-class deposit that's been pretty well studied by some famous world-class geologists. So we were pretty sure in the stratigraphy that was there and that there was evidence for lower mudstone units. We just had to find them. Um, so I guess some of the surprises have been some of the grades. We've hit some exceptional silver grades in some of our new exploration targets, like over a thousand grams per ton silver. So that's a bit unique, um, but not really. I mean, we had some hits in the water tower zone, uh, but we were kind of expecting them. I would say the SK Deeps is an area that was, we did about one 800 meter drill hole and found some mineralization quite deep at about 700 meters and an area that was not a mudstone. So that was an exciting new hit for us. But I would reiterate, it's pretty early days. Just, uh, you know, we've been focused on infill. Our, our geological team has laid out a hundred, over 100,000 meters wish list of what they could do. We're not going to do all that, of course. So I would say it's early days and there's a lot of exciting exploration results yet to come. Mm -hmm, fantastic. So then I have three questions um, concerning drilling or uh, regarding drilling. So first of all, how large is the drill program at SNP? First of the second one also about SNP, have you already started to drill SNP? And what is the planning at SNP and also at SK to how much drilling do you want to do in 2021? Sure, so at uh, SK, I mentioned we're doing 90,000 meters. At SNP, uh, we're probably doing 5,000 meters. So about 20, 25 drill holes. That has not started yet. That'll start up this month. Uh, I'm sure we're all aware it's the age of COVID, so things are, are slightly delayed. Uh, so uh, SNP drilling will start in October, and we're really focused on that 200-foot wall. If we have some success there, we will drill at SNP next year. So I can't yet say how much drilling we'll do at uh, SNP next year because it's very much dependent on the results that will come out at the end of this year. As for SK, again, exploration will be dependent next year on the success we have this year. So we're doing 90,000 meters, about 25% of that is exploration. Based on those results, we will prioritize exploration for, for 2021. But I mean, it could be, I would estimate anywhere between say 10 million and $20 million spent on exploration. You know, if we, if we hit a really nice juicy zone, then we will definitely drill it out and, and add some more ounces to SK Creek. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, also a question around the drilling. Um, have you faced any delays with the assay sample firm, uh, firms, meaning with the labs, and are the delays getting short? I mean, that's all through COVID-19, of course, right? Yeah, so I think the labs in British Columbia were caught a bit unprepared. Uh, I think they were expecting a slow summer in BC, and the government deemed mining an essential service, so it was very busy in the Golden Triangle for drilling this year. And yes, the assays were backed up. So uh, it started to um, get better now. And as I mentioned, Skina is shortly going to be one of the only companies drilling because the winter is coming. So when the winter comes, our assay turnaround times increase substantially. So we're looking at about four weeks right now. And um, we, we hope that'll improve as we go into the winter. Yeah, which is still okay for me because the assets are not getting, uh, uh, let's say, uh, lower in quality as you have to wait maybe two weeks. Sure. <laughs> um, there is a question from to acquire. Oh, Jochen, I'm sorry, Can I'm going to have to get you to repeat that one. Yeah, no problem. There's a question from an asset manager in Zurich um, for SNP. Hochschild has an option to acquire 60% at what conditions? Sure. So that option is good until October of next year. So there's a year left on it. And they would have to spend 2.75 times what we've spent in the ground to earn 60%. So those are the option terms. Uh, they've yet to tell us if they're, well, no, that's not true. They're very interested. They put out a press release when we put out our resource, but they've said it's not quite yet the size they're interested in. So we're at 650,000 ounces. They've said it would, they'd like it to be closer to 800,000 or a million. So I think it'll be a decision time for Hush Shield once we finish up our drilling this year. It's, it's really decision time for SNP once we're done our drilling this year. That'll really determine if it makes sense to add it to SK. Mm -hmm. If we do any more drilling next year and if Hoss Shield will back in. So all things that are yet to be determined, but we would be carried um, moving the project forward if Hoss Shield did exercise their option. 
Mm -hmm. Then there is a question on, let's say, the recent, let's call it sell-off, if you like, uh, of your shares from 340 down to 240, 250. Today you are up, of course, uh, after the drill results. And the analyst uh, coverage is, I think the average is around $455. Mm -hmm. How would you explain that? Is this just related to the weakness of gold and silver or what is it? Yeah, I would say it's completely market related. I mean, if you look at our peers, a lot of people have come off their highs in the last uh, month or so. There's so much volatility and uncertainty in the world, especially if you're in North America right now with everything that's going on in the U.S. So, yeah, frustrating. Um, the other thing I would say is Seen has had a very successful year. I mean, we've been up over 500 percent. So I do know a lot of people taking profits. But I would add that it's not, you know, mass dumping from one group. It tends to be general small selling off of small lots. So, yes, I share in your frustration, but it's just general market volatility. And, and hopefully we'll make up for it with some more good results and through uh, now until the end of the year. As you know, I'm a real positive guy. I see it as a buying opportunity. Completely agree with you. <laughs> Great. Then there is a question. Uh, I think you answered it already a little bit, but let's put it that way. How much how much more money would you need till the bankable feasibility study is also fully complete? I think you said you have the money in the bank, but let's assume you really have to uh, to uh, enlarge the drilling next year due to great results. So, of course, you have to you have to raise more money, right? Yes, yeah, so we we definitely we're, we're financed through this year and probably through to the PFS, but we will have to raise more money for environmental studies, the full feasibility study, drilling, and I would estimate that to be you know between say forty to fifty million will be the budget for next year. We're just working on it as we speak. So yes, there will be another financing in the future, probably next year at some point, and that should take us all the way through to the full feasibility study, which will be complete at the end of next year. Okay, super. Um, what is the total cost per meter drilled? Yeah, so this summer was a bit higher. Uh, There's a lot of strict COVID regulations that we had to put in place and it was all helicopter assisted. So we're we're at over just over $500 a meter right now for drilling, but that should drop off in the winter. So as we, the helicopters disappear and it's skid mounted, that price should go, but we're just over $500 a meter right now. Mm -hmm, great. Um, as we both know, exploration is sometimes uh, trial and error, of course. Um, but I would say in your case, this there is a real big plan behind, right? And uh, where do you see the main direction of the exploration going, let's say, for the next six months? Sure. So I think one of the main areas would be the possibility to push back the pit. So there's an area uh, to the north of the pit, the NEX zone, uh, that's got some really nice high grade ounces that are currently part of the underground resource. And with more drilling there and some more engineering, I could see the potential to push back the pit there. And then the other place I see potential is these, these lower mudstone units that I mentioned about, specifically the, the lower mudstone as opposed to the even lower mudstone because the lower mudstone is shallower. Um, you know, we're hitting some really beautiful high grade there and we just need to follow that zone and, and see the, the extent of it, the strike of it. And that's where I see some other potential. And then we're pretty excited about the possibilities of Tom McKay, which is that open pit target that I mentioned that's to the south because it outcrops, nearly outcrops at surface. And, you know, there's the potential to mine that and truck that to the mill. So those are my top three exploration excitement. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, any any uh, comments on ESG concerning the company? Do everything. Oh, Kelly, I cannot hear you now. Yeah, I'm back. Have you, have you heard me? Have you heard me? Yes. So I think the question okay. was about ESG. Yeah, and, uh, meaning uh, to, to me, you do everything right, or yeah. do you face any problems? Listen. It's um, a pride of our company that we put so much time into this. I don't understand how anyone can try and open a mind and not focus on ESG. Our First Nations relationship is extremely important to us. Um, you know, permitting, uh, we've got internships with the Tall Tan as we speak. In terms of the environmental side, you know, this is going to be a, a hydro run project. It's all going to be powered by hydropower. We're working with British Columbia Hydro to see, you know, how we can get credits back from that. So, no, it's something we spend a lot of time on. We're really focused on. Skeen has got a pretty young and keen management team. And I would hope that this is the way of the future for mining is that everyone focuses on ESG in the same way. 
Mm -hmm, great. Then we have another asset manager here from Zurich. Can you put some color on the agreement with Barrick? What are your obligations, like the payment of the 15 million? But I think this is all done with the shares now. Yes. Uh, LSR, royalties, and yes. is somebody from Barrick on the board? So yeah, as the, the full uh, deal term, so they originally had a, a back and right, which they extinguished, and there was a $10 million payment, but we canceled both of those out in exchange for giving them um, 22.5 million shares of the company. So they are now a 12.4% shareholder. They also have 11.25 million warrants. Those are exercisable at $2.70 for two years. So that could bring another $30 million into the company. They also have a pro rata to participate in future financings. Um, there's a contingent payment, which is never gonna happen. So if we, we option part of SK Creek, they would get a contingent payment, but there is no way we're gonna be optioning SK Creek to anybody. Um, and then their other was a right to appoint someone to the board. They've, they've not yet done that. They haven't chosen to do that yet. Uh, we've uh, requested and they agreed that if they do appoint someone, it would be someone with mine building experience. So someone who's put mines into production before. Mm -hmm. So, And then um, the final part was um, we had to post a bond with the government and that was a $2 million cash bond. And we've already posted that and transferred title. Mm -hmm. Super. Um, could you imagine to buy new properties by now in other regions of Canada? Or do you say, no, guys, we have so much work. This is so exciting. What we have, we focus completely on that. We are completely focused on pushing SK Creek forward. So it's not to say maybe we don't in the future. But as of right now, we were all extremely focused on, on pushing SK Creek forward. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, then a question for the future production. Do you need an autoclave or is it HL as you will produce a concentrate, right? I think you don't need that. There's no autoclave. Um, you know, the, we looked at pressure oxidation and biox plants and everything. Um, but the most, the best thing to do for SK is what they did historically, which is just to have a mill and, and float a con and ship that off to smelters. So it helps keep the capex low. We pay some smelter penalties in the first three years of mine life. But, you know, the, the concentrates running an ounce gold equivalent per ton, so we can afford a couple of smelter penalties. So, no, concentrate's definitely the way to go. Just a simple circuit, float a con, and ship it off to the smelters. Mm -hmm, fantastic. Maybe a question also from my side uh, with the concentrate then. How would that work? Would that be transported, like, let's say, with truck? Can you sure. rail it? Uh, how, yeah. how far is the smelter away? Or would yep. So we're looking, just want to make sure you can hear me. Okay, so we're looking at several options. Uh, there's a the most northerly deep water port in Canada is in a place called Stewart, which is less than 100 kilometers from us. So, uh, you know, historically, concentrate would have gone to that deep water port and then been shipped off around the world. The other option is rail. Uh, historically, a lot of the concentrate went to the Horn smelter, which Glencore now owns in Quebec. So we've entertained, we've received life of mine concentrate contracts from a number of smelters. We've done concentrate marketing studies. We're going to do more. We've received contracts to either ship overseas, say China or Eastern Europe, and also to rail out to Quebec. So we're, as we push forward with the PFS, we're gathering more bids because that's how you get the best price is have competitive bids. And so uh, we hope to improve upon the, the terms that we received for the PEA. We already have received better terms. Um, so there's quite a few options when you have such a high grade gold con it seems to be quite in demand i mentioned we already received contracts for the life of the mine we haven't signed any but we've received them so um it's definitely some uh, chance for optimization as we move into the pfs mm -hmm, great i'm I'm a little bit uh, confused on two questions but i still will ask them sure. because i no idea. What. Um, any thoughts about taking over SK Mining or doing a corporation? Yeah, so there's a project to the south of us, which is called SK Mining. Ah. They're not a mining company, nor do they have SK Creek. Um, <laughs> they're an exploration stage company. Uh, there's some, you know, they're they're looking for the same rock types that we have at our project. So n no, w there's no immediate interest there. We've We've got ample mineralization left to search for on our project. Absolutely. Great. Um, question also from my side. Um, if we look at the SK Creek, let's say the future mine, and if we also look at the SNP project, as you said, you want to add high-grade material then to the future, let's say, SK Creek uh, mill and processing plant. Um, do you think there might be 
uh, or there might arise any problems, let's say metallurgy wise, geology wise, rock yeah. type wise. So have you, uh, if, when, when, when you blend that high grade in? It, or, or is it is it like the uh, the uh, same type of ore? Yeah. So this is why I said it's it's early days to decide because we don't know the answer to that yet. So uh, mm -hmm. after the drilling that we do this year, you know, we're going to reach out to the engineers and they'll do a study to see about the blendability of SNP and SK. So yes, a great question that I don't yet know the answer to. Um, okay. SNP is very clean, high grade ore. They were getting you know up to fifty percent gravity recovery on site. So we don't. Our, our engineering team doesn't envision any issues, but definitely something that will still need to be tested. And that'll probably happen at uh, the end of this year, beginning of next year. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. Um, then also a question from my side. Um, we saw in one of the slides that uh, those uh, old open pits were filled with water. And um, the question is like... Uh, so there's no, there's no open pit that was filled with water. It was all underground historically. So the pictures that I showed were the tra tailing storage facility. Tailing, sorry. And they're not, they're natural lakes. They're non-fish bearing lakes that are there. They're naturally occurring. And that's what we put the tailings and the waste into historically. Ah, okay. I see. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Now, uh, then the other question would be because uh, yeah, that, that, would, that would be my thinking then if you face any issues, let's say with groundwater or with rain flooding uh, for, for, for a future open pit. That's uh, not a problem. Uh, with the pit no i mean there's drainage built into the mine plan there's snow removal built into the mine plan that, that's all definitely taken to into account with the pea mm -hmm. okay super um then let me see here hang on one second please Ah, do you believe that you can shorten the timeline to production? Also from my side, a question in addition to that can we plan for 2023 with a possible production start Listen, so we said baseline was 2024. We are going to do everything in our power to try and expedite this. Um, we've got a working group going with the government and the tall tan to look at each aspect of the mine plan, what needs to go through the full environmental process and what can be expedited because it's a brownfield site. So we're doing everything in our power. One of the reasons we are on this BC Regional Mining Alliance, uh, we're going to we're going to try and do it as quickly as possible. And that's why I said base case was Q1 of 2024. Okay, super. And for the resource estimate, that's for the first quarter also next year. Do you yes. see that more to the end of the quarter? Most definitely, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm, probably great. most likely March. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, super. Um, do you think, there's another question here, do you think you could optimize and maybe lower the CapEx in the in the PFS or in the feasibility study? I don't see it being lowered. If anything, I think it, it could go up slightly. And uh, that's generally um, talking to our chief operating officer. Um, uh, you know, we might try and get more tons per day through the mill or something like that. So if anything, I see it going up slightly, but not substantially. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, super. Yeah, so let me double check here that we have not missed somebody because we are coming slowly to the end here. But that looks all good. Yes, fantastic. That is all fine. Super. Yeah. Okay, then I think uh, we made it through. Thank you very much, Kelly. That was an exciting presentation. And uh, yeah, sorry for some hiccups. Maybe it could be also from time to time my internet line here in Austria. But uh, we are all fine with that. And I think you have a wonderful company, wonderful project, and you've done a great job. And we look forward to some big uh, news flow, of course, over the coming months. And we look forward to the resource estimate. Great. Me too. Thank you very much for having me, Jochen. Thank you very much. Bye now. Yeah, I'm not sure we've seen our Sorry. Excuse me? Do you want to say something? I just said goodbye. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Then, ladies and gentlemen, that was our virtual roadshow with Skina Resources and Kelly Earl, the Vice President of Communication. And yeah, fantastically presented by a woman here, which uh, has a fantastic knowledge and did a great job in presenting this great company. And uh, yeah, as I think uh, the lower stock price of the last uh, two, three weeks is a great buying opportunity. I ex actually rate the company very high with a $7 
Star Price Target. Longer term, I see even a double digit number, definitely. And uh, I have a very good feeling that we will have a lot of fun in the future here with this company and uh, with the SK Creek mind and hopefully being in the next three years into production. That would be fantastic as we need the jobs and Canada needs some taxes, of course, also, but the world needs the gold. And that is also for sure. So I would uh, suggest you maybe do some more due diligence on the company and uh, have a close look on that. You find, of course, all information also in German, also on our website. Skina will be part of the Edelmetallmesse virtual event in Munich, where we have also translated the presentation into German and you find all information there. And yeah, we look forward to see you hopefully next week on our next virtual roadshow with Aztec Minerals that will be on Tuesday next week. Invitations were sent out already. So thank you very much again, Kelly. I wish you a beautiful day today. All the best and hope to see you soon and all to you. Stay healthy. That's the most important things in, uh, thing in those times and uh, all the best and have a lovely evening wherever you are in the world. Thanks and bye-bye from Austria.